Hey, everybody, you're listening to the Total Basis Podcast. I am your host, Felipe, and over there with me is my guest for today's episode is Baltimore Orioles fan, Alex Robertson. Alex, how are you doing this morning? Doing good, Felipe. I was just really excited to be able to be a part of this podcast. No, oh, but thanks for accepting the invite. Uh, just kind of uh, on a whim, I decided to do I, I just did an episode with my friend Harry, but I, it's been so long. I, I think it's since the beginning of the year. Uh, since I last put up episode, I feel like I'm making up for lost time. I'm, I got to uh, turn these out now because this is the middle of the fantasy baseball draft season. So lots of things are going on and pitchers and catchers are about to report soon if they haven't already. Because I think the Dodgers and Padres, they, they, they are actually starting their season earlier than everybody else because they get to play in Korea. So that's exciting. But it uh, it, it does build up a, a what do you call it? Um a sense of urgency, so to speak, because if there's once they start, then that's when things start accelerating, at least in my viewpoint. I know that uh, for fantasy baseball purposes, I mean, I know that you haven't played. Fan- Tell me again, your timeline of fantasy baseball again. Uh, when's the last time you I've played? I've been and- off and on for about 10 years. I don't uh, played last like two years ago. Uh, last year, it was just like a bunch of stuff going on. So. Yeah, uh, but it's been kind of off and on for about ten years. Ten years, and and when's the last time you played? Uh, twenty twenty two. Oh, okay. So you skip. So you skip last year for personal reasons, but twenty twenty two. So it's only been a year. Um, our friend Harry, who was on the podcast earlier this week, he says he's been on and off for twenty years or so, and he thinks that the last time he played was maybe t- either two thousand seven, two thousand nine, thereabouts. So. Uh, I mean, I mean, obviously, what is that about 15 years or so? Uh, 15 years is not as bad as one or two years, but uh, I'm sure that you were, you're still paying attention to it. You're still making mental notes like, well, if I had a fantasy baseball team, I would do this, that, and the other. So in, in that break that you took from fantasy baseball, uh, did you take any mental notes as to uh, if I were to start a fantasy baseball team, I would want player X to build around who is your player X to build around. And if you had one last year, um, probably who I took my first pick on the year before, uh, was, uh, Trey Turner. Mm, mm, uh, mm. but it, it, if not that, you know, someone that's, you know, like a top five ish player. Um, I mean, like a healthy, like Bryce Harper would probably be someone, you know, maybe kind of like not definitively on the list, but not definitively off. The, the list two or like uh I don't know, someone that's like that like elite caliber player. Um mm. I, I like Trey Turner a lot in, in fantasy because he you know not only hits for power, he's you know speed and yeah. and, and things yeah. like that. And and you can trust that regardless of if you're in a points league or if you're in like a category league, you can kind of trust that he's gonna fill enough of different categories so it accumulates enough points in, in total you know regardless of which type of league that you're in and it, uh even though my 2022 team kind of faltered because people kept getting hurt you know after the all-star break i was like man great three turners that guy yeah i think in the league I, that you're joining us the uh the, actually it's called the total basis podcast league um which um, Austin and I, my friend Austin and I, we we uh, co-commission. Um, in the first year, I think it was the 2022 season, and Trey Turner was my first round pick overall. And I remember I looked around and I actually did a little victory dance. And I said, guys, with this pick, I just won the championship. You guys are letting me win the championship this early, huh? Okay. And sure enough, I did struggle. I mean, I, I my team was up and down, up and down, but eventually I, I started getting the hang of this uh, whole league of uh, and I did end up, you know, running the gamut. Is that, is that the term running the gamut? I ran the gauntlet, whatever that yeah. saying is, is it gamut or gauntlet? I never know. Is that even, a, is that even a I, saying? I, uh, <laughs> honestly, as much as I know, like words, th- this one's kind of like a one that stops me. I can't remember which one. And I, I ask because um, I'm always, 
when it comes to cliches, I, there was a point in my life where I was making like I I would purposely butcher them. I think it must have come from uh George Bush butchering uh, uh what what was it the fool me once shame on you fool me twice well you can't fool me again <laughs> and I go well shit oh and, yeah yeah and and that was on like the um uh, J Cole song wasn't uh, it? Uh, which one man you got twenty fourteen four still drives uh what was it like. Was it uh no no role models? Uh, maybe that was like the break. It was like that little break, and then it had the George Bush thing going on. Uh, honestly, I've only listened to that song a handful of times. I'm not the biggest J Cole fan. I, I'm actually trying to listen to more J Cole and a lot of more of that uh, early 2010s hip hop. So, because I know it starts with Kendrick Lamar, and then it just siphons or uh, it um, the tributaries after after uh, Kendrick Lamar go off into his label mates and then j cole and then all these other uh critically acclaimed hip-hop artists but it's a lot of critically acclaimed hip-hop artists so i don't just listen to one rapper i listen to a bunch of rappers and then i forget who the hell i'm listening to but it all starts with it all starts and ends with kendrick lamar and then it just trickles down to everybody else as far as i'm concerned so i cannot so unlike uh other people who are hip to the uh to that type of stuff I have no idea what the hell you're talking. And I listen to role models a handful of times. And I, I don't I, I don't remember that part. I would have to re- <laughs> I would have to look up the lyrics again. But like I said, the, uh, <laughs> Bush uh, made that. I think that's where it started. But even then, I was already like butchering them on purpose just because uh, English is my second language, believe it or not. Spanish is my first language. So I, I didn't grow up in, and I grew up in a Mexican immigrant household. So I, I don't know a lot of these old timey mm-hmm. sayings. So it's to the now it's to the point where I sometimes don't even know if I'm using certain phrases correctly. So that's why I ask. I figured, well, <laughs> you're the right complexion. You should know what I'm talking about. But at any rate, uh, long story short, I won that championship uh, as Trey Turner, even though he had the really bad batting average that year, uh, from what I remember. I just remember he... Was it like 240-something? I think so, but I, I, I think... Well, that's going to be the first thing we do. Let's look it up. Uh, Trey Turner, what the hell? Was he had playing? good power numbers. He had the – he. I think he had, like, a good amount of stone bases, like 30-ish. Yeah. yeah. Like, the counting stats – The counting stats were there, Alex. The, the, I remember the counting stats were there, but we also take into account batting average and on-base percentage. And, okay, so here we go. 21 home runs, 100 RBI. 27 stolen bases. That's good numbers. Uh, okay, two, 298 batting average. But I swear to God that he was really like not – he was slumping for a, for a, a long time that season with the Dodgers. And then compared to what he did in 2021 and 2020 where he hit for a 328 batting average and a 335 batting average respectively, it, it, it was kind of a big letdown. A three, yeah. I'm sorry, what? The the two ninety something that average is kind of like oh like is he you know going to be able to keep up now be on on a new team you know and a pitcher friendly ballpark too from what I gather right yeah. Los Angeles is yeah. known okay uh three forty three on base percentage which hey if you know for a guy who steals bases that's pretty high yeah but the two previous years he was at three seventy five three ninety four even in uh 2019 when they when the Nationals won the championship he was at 353 so the 343 was well below uh his three year uh averages from the last mm-hmm. uh, in terms of on base the slugging percentage was at 466 not that we keep track of slugging percentage but that's always a pretty good indicator uh, of production uh, especially of the extra base hits variety because we also keep track of that in this league doubles triples well, triples is a speed category. Anyway, that's a technicality. So even though he had a really good season, but by his standards and in recent memory, uh, it was pretty much a, a letdown. But that's okay. I had I, My team was stacked that year. It was pitching that was letting me down th- for the majority of the year because I waited so long to pick a pitcher because – and not to bore anybody about, well, back in my day, this is what I did and that did. But I'm just providing context here that there was two auto-draft teams – at that time and the stupid auto draft kept picking all the good pitchers all the pitchers actually so what happens when everybody zigs felipe zags and i just concentrated on hitters <laughs> on my hitting lineup i concentrated on relief pitchers so i was able to draft emmanuel classe and josh Hader as my two top guys which that was a mistake because that was i think that was the year that 
uh, Hater kind of had a meltdown of sorts, I believe. Yeah, right, yeah. Right? right? Kase uh, had a pretty good year that year. Who? Kase, yes. Kase. Yes, he did. Yes, you're right. Yeah, yep, he did. I know. Um, I had him in two he, in my other league as well. Go ahead. balanced out the Hater meltdown. <laughs> so, hopefully, <laughs> balanced it out. I mean, I won the championship that year. But yeah, the pitching. <laughs> I, mean, Fran, I mean, to give you a minute, Franbro Valdez was my ace pitcher that year. Hmm. And in retrospect, that's pretty damn good. But at that time, Framber Valdez was like a number two. You know, if you're if let's say you're to start seven pitchers per week, Valdez would have been a number two at the at best. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Mid rotation guy. Like three. Like yeah. Three. Three's more like it. Yeah. It's an unknown commodity. Uh, you know, doesn't have the track record and stuff, but he does pitch for a really good team in the in Houston. Um pretty talented potential but it's still you know the floor is is unpredictable but i i lucked out i mm-hmm. i believed in Framvel valdez and he uh rewarded me for trusting him but it, you know yeah my, my pitching was terrible it was it was way behind the eight ball so anyway and then the in 2023 because you are joining this league i might as well let you know that in 2023 it was the opposite my hitting was bad even though i drafted julio rodriguez with my number one pick overall and I drafted Spencer Strider at number three with the third round pick and Randy Arozarena. I might have picked them too early, but I still, you know, this is around the time of the WBC, the World Baseball Classic. And, you know, mm-hmm. I am I am Team Mexico and I fell in love with Randy Arozarena, man. Randy was the guy. Uh, Captain Mexico, Capitan Mexico, Super Randy Arozarena. I lo- loved his performance. Uh, and uh, I could. Don't get me started on the WBC because I'll never shut up about it. It was such a great experience. Uh, if you guys are thinking of uh, if it comes again, which I, it will, I'm saying it like it comes again because there was a lot of controversy with the pitchers and the hitters that got injured because he played in the WBC. Uh, maybe, well, that's another topic for another discussion. But if it does come around and all these players agree that they want to represent their countries, just go, just go, just go without hesitation. Just go. It is worth your time. It's an electric atmosphere. But anyway, um, the point was that uh, I relied much more on pitching last year than I did on hitting. My hitting was the one that was letting me down, but my team was better for it. So I don't know what is it is with this league and, the, and pitching. So maybe there's something to that. But the pitching was so dominant in a year where pitching was so weak. I, I know you didn't play last year, but I think you might have noticed, right? You 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 did notice how weak pitching yeah. was. Yeah, like the when you have Baltimore, who had a pretty good year, over like a great year overall and a pretty decent year of pitching, but they're seventh in the league with almost a four ERA. Mm-hmm. Like that, that's kind of like okay, like are we in the middle of like prime steroid era where everybody is like got numbers like ballooned up or are we in like a season where there's supposed to be really good talent but they're just like just like blowing it all right so you know what you know what batting i'm sorry to interrupt you but you do know what batting average on balls in play are right that that stat yeah yeah all right so i imagine it was it seems skewed right well, uh, you know what? I, w- I was just gonna talk about it, but I'm gonna share my screen for a little bit, right? If you allow me. Uh oh, I have. Oh, okay. So it's screen number three, and these are the league stats since 2016. This is something I've been meaning to do. I'm finally getting around to doing it live on, um, as of the recording of this podcast. But here's the batting average on balls in play right here, and uh, you know, it it seemed to be on average. I remember average is 300, right? So it, mm-hmm. it was hovering around there. And then in 2020, it went down to 292. In 2021, it went down to 292. It got worse in 2022 at 290. And then, boom, back up to 297. So I think what this tells me, Alex, is that the shift was really on this year, on the, mm-hmm. these three, this three-year period, right? Uh, and 2019 was the year of the home run ball, you know? Oh, yeah. The Six. Twins had what, like... yeah. They had like three hundred something home runs. I mean, the anomaly is right and there. S- almost seven thousand home runs were hit in twenty nineteen. 
and then and baseball wants us to believe that they didn't do anything to factor oh, into that. Yeah, they're definitely uh baseball has been known to doctor their baseballs and do all types of things. Yeah. There's a dead ball era, and there's a live ball era, and there's a rabbit ball era, and there's a launch angle revolution. Uh, but as you can see, strikeouts are are kind of uh, about even keel from the last. Uh, you know, there's there's still a, a increasing since 2016, and they're and they're kind of settled around the 23 percent mark. Last year it fell down to 22.7, but it's that's technically a, an increase compared to 2022 when they're at 22.4 percent. Mm-hmm. Walks are up, but you know that's the name of the game. We want our hitters to walk more. So it's been kind of stable at about eight point five in this uh what would you say the seven years seven season stretch is it no eight season stretch sorry uh mm-hmm. you you see that runs actually increased compared to what they were in twenty twenty one and twenty twenty two so two forty eight batting average that's uh that's a high uh since twenty nineteen because when it was at two fifty two but after twenty nineteen it dropped to around to the Two four the mid two forties, but last year was at mm. two forty eight. On base percentage went back up to three twenty. Uh, after sub three twenty collective years in twenty twenty one and twenty twenty two, slugging percentage went back up to four fourteen compared to last year. So twenty twenty two, uh, was a really good year for pitchers and a really bad year for hitters, and then twenty twenty three was a really good year for hitters, but really bad for pitchers. Uh, no, look at this identical wars. In 2023 mm-hmm. and 2022, so I think would I guess people would say that's why war is a fake stat. <laughs> it's a fake stat. It's uh, a bullshit stat, you know. So uh, I hear way too often they're like, "Oh, war, like what's up with this war stat?" And I'm like, "Oh, you know, you know, most if not all stats are like technically made up. Yes, you know, <laughs> you're trying to find a way to quantify." what is going on and oh uh, like it is it's hard to try to explain in more detail to like the significantly older crowd of baseball fans like but, why well, other stuff is just as important the pro yeah and the problem is what i was telling my guy harry was the other issue is that if you don't come in with an open mind to any of this then the battle is already lost because you and I can go in there and explain as patiently as we can what war is, and, and we have I have this argument with Melvin all the time. Like if you, he he's a firm believer, if you can explain this to me uh, in layman's terms, then then that just shows that number one, you don't know what you're talking about, and number two, it, it just proves that the, this war metric isn't isn't all what it's cracked up to be. And that's my best Melvin impersonation, uh, the Puerto Rican <laughs> accent and all. But I mean, mm-hmm. I mean, fudge it, man. I mean, you want me to give you a crash course on something that the Fangraphs page, which I'm going to show you what the Fangraphs page looked like. Says, what is war? And it's, it's this lengthy of an explanation. I'm still going. Look, I'm still scrolling down. And explain. Yeah, and like... there's, and that's just part one. This is just the intro. <laughs> there's a part one for batting, part two for fielding, part three for positional uh, uh, adjustments, part four for Wasn't every place of value. Parts? Eight parts for the team yeah, context. Eight. And that's just an offense. Eight parts on just <laughs> offense. And there's eight, and then seven you have parts. What, like, pitching. Seven parts on defense? Pitching. Oh, seven pitching? Parts on, yeah. Uh, introduction. What is FIP? Replacement. Run environments. Converting runs to wins. What about the park adjustments? And where is the calculation? I mean, it... it and, and, and look, they have all these links for further reading because this wasn't enough. But they try the Fangress page tries to dumb it down for you into little, and it's still not good enough. They have freaking graphs. They tell you that Nafi Perez in 2002 was the worst player ever with a negative 3.1 wins above replacement in uh, 2002. Um, yeah. So, and, and the fact that the other one is, oh, well, there's just too many people with their own definition of what war is, you know, because there's the baseball reference war, baseball perspectives has their own metric on, on determining what overall value, and Fangraphs obviously has their own metric that people don't seem to like, I mean, but I only use Fangraphs. So. Isn't Go. that just like slight alterations to what the general concept of it is? 
Yeah, just a slight variation, you know, or it just so happens that I think it's a good thing that you have different, uh, what do you call it? Let me go back to this other page. Well, no, I'll just stay with the war page. You have different definitions of what war of what one stat is, right? Because it, it 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 kind of uh, checks and balances against each other. And remember, the big key point is that Baseball Reference still uses ERA when it comes to their mm. pitching war, their pitching war. But uh, Fangraphs uses uh, field independent pitching, which is a statistic that takes account into how many strikeouts you're giving out or uh, outputting, how many walks are you limiting, how many home runs are you limiting. Mm -hmm. basically if there was no fielders behind you can you dominate can you uh yeah. can you pitch without that dependency and obviously there are it... some uh, so, sorry to interrupt go, the, go, the, go, there's go. some pitchers that it, like their fip is significantly lower mm -hmm. than the era mm -hmm. and then you've got like some pretty really good pitchers that their fip is on the opposite end like like way too high and that's kind of like okay well like you know how good is your feeling like as a defense and mm -hmm. then you know, like if you're like on a really really solid team you know like a 1970 orioles that has like brooks robinson frank robinson you know mm -hmm. all those guys it's like okay mark well then that's gonna skew your number yeah mark belancher uh bobby garrich was on that team too on those yeah. Orioles rich uh yeah yeah right i mean those are two guys who are borderline hall of fame defensive players right there aren't hell even bobby garrett as a second baseman is criminally underrated but here it is oh, you're yeah. right 285 fip versus a 386 era that's spencer strider who i still say mm -hmm. should have won the Cy young last year but it went to uh uh blake snell blake snell and his five walk rate his uh Five point whatever walk for nine innings. There, there he is. Four point nine five, respectable three forty four FIP. Mm -hmm. But his ERA was two twenty five. That's what you were alluding to. That there are guys, yeah. yeah. So the the most uh, most balanced pitcher is obviously Sonny Gray, right? Two eighty three FIP versus two seventy nine ERA. He is who we thought he was, and we let him off the hook. So sorry, <laughs> <laughs> right, Dennis Green. There's my guy, Framber Valdez, who 350 FIP, 345 ERA. So he's about right. He's about legit. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and and the 350 FIP, some people would say, wasn't that a little bit too high? And last year, among qualifying pitchers, starting pitchers, that was good enough to finish in 14th place. Mm -hmm. It's a brave, brave new world. Ah, so there that and and of course the stat like war also accounts for league averages, which the traditional numbers don't account for. Yada yada yada. I mean, we know, you and I know what's up, but again, if you don't, uh, know, go ahead. Oh, uh, and, and you know, of course, like the you know they it's like you know, are you like a certain percentage above, certain percentage below the like one hundred you know uh, mm -hmm. average? And I like the with. Even stuff like um uh like OPS plus or uh ERA plus that they factor in ballpark. Because yeah, yeah. How, how are you gonna inherently say that someone is significantly better when they play eighty one games at cores mm -hmm. and the other people are only playing like two series there? Yeah, and that's another one that we, you know, as you could tell, uh, Alex, I like to connect my podcast episodes. They're not isolated. There's always a connection to it all, uh, and that's something I talked to with Harry about. I keep mentioning that because we talked a lot that in that in that one. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that we did talk about was, uh, oh, we were talking about some American League East pitcher because he's a Yankee fan, or or mm -hmm. someone. Yeah, oh, shoot, now I can't remember who it was, but we were talking about how much he was struggling last year. And he goes, wait, or was it, or maybe, maybe we were talking about Adley Rushman and how he kind of, oh, because, okay, so I think what we were talking about was we took three pitchers after August 21st. We took their stats from after August 21st, right? Three catchers, actually, three catchers. Adley Rushman, mm -hmm. Gab Gabriel Moreno, and Bo Naylor of the Cleveland Guardians. Moreno plays for the Diamondbacks. Mm -hmm. And we talked about Rushman after August 21st. He kind of slowed down. I mean, play discipline was still there, but he kind of slowed down. Like you weren't getting that first, that first number one catcher production. Like 
because these two rookies were, especially uh, Naylor was just beating the crap out of the ball at that time. He, it was finally clicking for him as a rookie. Mm -hmm. And Moreno was finally healthy enough to get more playing time for the Diamondbacks. It's not a coincidence that the Diamondbacks started uh, making a push for the playoffs and even made it to the World Series. Because as you know, Alex, a catcher, a really good catcher makes all the difference in the world for these real teams, right? And I think mm -hmm. Moreno played a big part. And I can say Moreno uh, was actually giving you Adley Rushman production and you didn't have to give up a, an early round pick to get him, right? So Harry brings up, well, it could also be that, you know, Rushman plays on a tougher division, right? Right. He plays in a tougher division, right? Maybe he, the competition is so high that Rushman it has an unfair advantage or a disadvantage. He's at a disadvantage is what he was trying to say. Mm -hmm. And I go, well, Gabriel Moreno plays in the National League West, which is notorious for being a pitcher-friendly environment. You have the San Francisco ballpark, which is a massive ballpark. Dodger Stadium, we just talked about, notorious pitcher-friendly ballpark. I don't know what Arizona is in terms of you know, hitter friendly or pitcher friendly, but mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure that and they you can... got uh, Pecco, which is oh yeah, you know, which has got people throwing through loops. Mm -hmm. And uh, they even moved the fences in like about ten years ago. I remember they moved in fences, and it, and it still has that reputation. Uh, and I was gonna mm -hmm. say the Diamondbacks. I believe it's one of those teams that use use humidors, but either way, they can manipulate the the the. Uh, the biodome of that field, you know, mm. whether they turn up the heat or turn on the air conditioner, I forgot. I think if the air conditioner is on high, then it becomes a home run hitting ballpark. I think that's what, they, that's the way they used to describe the Houston Astros uh, at the Astrodome. Remember that one? Mm -hmm. When the when the air conditioner was on, the balls were flying, but there were times where they would turn up the heat because I remember that players were complaining that they were sweating so much, even though they were indoors and it was supposed to be a, a climate control environment yeah. that they turn up the heat so the pitchers wouldn't give up so many home runs. So I'm pretty sure you could do the same thing with with Arizona. And even the Rockies, they use human doors. But how often are you playing the Rockies, especially in this new age of baseball where there's more of a balanced schedule as opposed to an unbalanced schedule that we've seen so for so many years. So mm -hmm. basically I did not want to give I did not want to give credence to that to that um argument because both guys rushman and moreno have advantages and disadvantages to their that that they have to deal with so um but anyway uh, yeah that's why i'm bringing it bringing it up because you're right there are ballpark factors we need to account for on a year-to-year -year basis so anyway so that that's go ahead i'm sorry go no uh, it's just one last thing about that thing um like people in granted Nolan Ryan, I'm going to mention him real quick. He's obviously really great. I think people give him a little too much credit when they're trying to rank him. Mm -hmm. But talent-wise, just pure talent-wise, like you can't really argue that he uh, wasn't, you know, on the on, on a short list of if he had all this stuff together, that he would be like. It, at minimum top five but yeah. mm -hmm. people seem to forget that most of his career and this is this is even when the unbalanced schedule was even more skewed mm. yeah back in the 70s you're playing in the astrodome you're playing at uh was it anaheim stadium mm. you're playing at like all kinds of significantly pitcher friendly ballparks mm-hmm so even if you're giving up hits or you're walking a lot of people, like you have that unfair uh, advantage when it comes to like your uh, advanced metrics mm -hmm. because you're playing in a park where most people aren't hitting much anyway. Yeah, the advanced metrics would show that that advantage, but you're right. At the end of the day, fly balls – are more likely to die in the West Coast than they are in the East Coast. And that's mm -hmm. and that that's just science. That, that there's documentaries about you know weather patterns out in the West Coast, bigger ballparks out in the West Coast. There's more room. You're you're not just um, 
you're you're not uh, uh, limited to the to the size of a city block. You have a lot of landscape that has not been used. I mean, shit, the Dodgers literally kicked out an entire community just to build Dodger Stadium because it was so mammoth. And to this day, it's I mean, shoot, L don't get me started because then now we're gonna talk about mound sizes and you know the disadvantage. Uh, the okay. huge advantage, I should say, that Sandy Koufax and Don Dreisel had, and, and, and that people get mad yeah. when I mention that. Bob Gibson also, that three- or four-year stretch. Where, where the reason was... why the mound got adjusted was because of how dominant he was. Bob Gibson, Sandy Koufax, like, okay, yeah. there's something wrong. And, and not just that, but the Dodgers were notorious for, for, for purposely making their mounds a lot higher than everybody else. And by the time mm. everybody else caught up to it, it was too late and Major League Baseball stepped in and said, yeah, yeah, we're not doing this anymore. Come on, let's make this uniform. They'll make that uniform, but they won't make the dimensions of every ballpark uniformed. But yeah, whatever. You've got, like, you know, you've got Petco, you've got uh, Oracle, you've got uh, Dodger Stadium, you've got the Coliseum in Oakland, yeah. which is notorious for not giving up home runs and especially down the lines. And you're like, okay, but how, you, you ever see I, some of those uh, New York? I was gonna. I'm sorry to cut you off, but I was gonna ask you, you: Have you ever seen those dimensions for those old timey New York ballparks, like the Polo Grounds, Ebbets Field? Oh, even... yeah, the ones with like 280 in the corner and like almost <laughs> 500 in center. That's ridiculous. But again, it's like they talk. Well, back in those days, pitchers used to throw eight innings, nine innings, and they weren't looking at their bullpen. Yeah, well, shoot, they were throwing like. 80 <laughs> well not just that <laughs> not just that but i remember like I, I, I this book I, I was reading about the new york yankee dynasty in the 50s and 60s and they were talking about vic rashi and well vic rashi he never liked being pulled from the game because he, it was his game and it was his ball and damn it they would have to pry it from his hand and he always had enough reserves on the back of his arm just when he had to reach back a little further to throw out the the next pitch and throw a little harder for the next guy he always he he always had a little bit of juice for that for those moments, but then you look at the Yankee Stadium at that time, like well, sh and you look at the statistics too around that time, the fifties and sixties, right? Uh, and I, I, I well, I'll hold on. I'm just gonna turn off the share screen, but I might as well say this and go back to the to what I'm showing here. But if you look at the walk rates of that time, guys were throwing were were walking four or five guys per nine innings, and you're like, wait. These are supposed to. This is supposed to be when, when, when baseball was at its golden era. All these guys who were mm -hmm. like their strikeout per nines were like around three, four, five, and their walks per nines were like four, five, six. This doesn't make any sense. I thought strikeouts were the thing, and it turns out no. Back then, they didn't care about strikeouts. If you give up a walk, well, that's better than giving up a hit. And last but not least, guys like who play in Yankee Stadium on a regular basis. You know, if you 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 uh, you had the advantage of painting corners uh, and and getting hitters to swing at pitches that they wouldn't want to pitch, uh, hit I should say, and when they do hit it, they would hit the balls deep to center, right center, left center field, and the balls would die because that ball's not going. It's that they used to call Yankee Stadium that center field area. They used to call it Death Valley because that's where balls went to die. Mm -hmm. The, the, don't give me this nonsense. Like, well, back in those days, starting pitchers were built different. They were just stronger. Like, no, nah, man. What happened mm -hmm. to Sandy Colfax? What happened to Sandy Colfax? I thought pitchers were built different back then. What happened to Sandy Colfax? Yeah. Okay. I, I always uh, talk to my dad about some of this stuff, too, because he, he's a little more old school. But I always talk about him, like, for every, like, Nolan Ryan type guy that you want to mention who was just, like, mm -hmm. a workhorse, you know, never came off the mound. I'm like, you can probably name like a dozen dudes <laughs> off the top of your head whose careers got destroyed within like three to five years because they never took care of themselves. Yeah. Or they didn't they they didn't prioritize like, oh hey, like I actually have to, you know, make sure that I'm good every time I go out there because my team actually needs me to be healthy or yeah whatnot. And, and if Ronald, Nolan Ryan was so durable and so good, how many championships does he have besides, what, 69 with the Mets when he was just – I think he might have been just a rookie that year. Back into the bullpen kind of. Yeah. I, I mean, this is not meant it to is. be the Nolan Ryan show, but we're making it the Nolan Ryan show here. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he, he had that one, which was just him being simply on the team, like he hadn't figured himself out. All right, yet. so look – And he has no Cy Youngs. Mm. 
wasn't the best pitcher in any individual year, but yeah. people want to claim that he's the GOAT. And, yeah. you know, like, I get that, you know, you got the nostalgia of, like, oh, man, like, when I went to that game and he was, you know, he was, like, on fire, struck out, like, 14 people and went the whole the whole way. Yeah. I get that, but, like, you have to – take off the like rose color glasses and realize his numbers don't show that he was as good as people think. Yeah. In 1969, when the Mets, the miracle Mets won the world series, he played in 25 games. He started 10 games. So you're right. Mm-hmm. Bullpen type of guy, spot starter. Uh, okay. So here's what I noticed here. when he was in California, so this I'm highlighting this number, the 10.43, those are, that's the strikeout per nine innings column. The 4.9 mm-hmm. in is the walk per nine innings. So in California, look at that number. 4.9A, 4.47, 4, 5.46, six walks per nine <laughs> innings. And then the year after that was like a five, seven something. So it was, uh, uh, yeah, it, there, there's a yeah, trend happening. L- pay attention to this trend, okay? Yeah. California, we talked about Anaheim Stadium being a pitcher's ballpark, right? Because it was California, a uh, hu- uh, uh, denser air. It's, uh, yeah, it's... It, larger ballpark then you get to the houston years right in 1980 as my kid is knocking on the door trying to get inside but oh well she can't come in you see that walk rate dropping 3.77 4.11 3.92 4.63 and you know you could say well he must have learned something from them the the pitching guys in houston right he must have learned something or they maybe they worked on his mechanics or maybe he did something to himself he got a a big free agent contract i mean things could have happened right he could be developing as a 33 year old a developing pitcher at 33 years old <laughs> but it's what i talked about earlier back in those days um you know if the astros uh when they turn on the air conditioners home runs were coming out of the ballpark when they turned them off and they had the heat on it became the a very hard place to hit home runs I'm wondering mm-hmm. if they somehow realized that from the get-go and were able to manipulate that to I limit would... the home runs. Because while we talked about in California, yeah, he could give up all these walks, but he can also let guys uh, pitch for more contact or hit the ball with more contact because fly balls are just going to die in the outfield anyway. Yeah. Yeah, look look at this minute home runs uh, total. These are the home runs per nine, the 0.44. Uh, and they're hovering around that nothing goes they're hovering around 0.4 to 0.6 right then you get to For houston years. yeah and that's and it goes up a little bit yeah it go, it goes up but it, it does, nothing too crazy the houston mm-hmm. look what happened in houston 0.12 <laughs> it, it, it's a third, second third year with second them? year in, in Houston, 0.12, 0.39 in his first year in Houston. It went up to 0.72, but then it went down to 0.41. So it, it's more fluctuation in Houston than yeah, that in... tells you that they probably you know change the the heat in air. I mean, and what can I mean? What else can it be? And then you get to the Texas Rangers and 0.64, 0.79 is probably as since he became a, a regular starting pitcher. Zero points uh, when he left New York, I should say. So he left New York in 1972. So let's say since 1972, 0.79 in 1990 is the highest home run per nine per nine innings that he that he's ever posted, which is pretty darn mm-hmm. good when you look at the number at, at, at for what it is. But what happened in 1990? Uh, well, as you know now, these hitters were finding out, hey, there's these injections. That are gonna help you, <laughs> and he pitched in two hundred four innings that year. Like people like to talk about Nolan Ryan, like oh, he was pitching three thousand innings per season. You know, even as he that was as only he got older, like the prime in Houston, he was pitching like three thirty per year. Okay, well, we're still I, walking like two hundred guys every season. Yeah, and that's, that's what baffles me. He's like, okay, he's pitching like. More innings than almost any guy in Major League history, but he's also walking more guys than anybody in Major League history. But look at this, uh, Alex, 1980, 233 innings pitch, 149. Well, that's a strike year, but okay, well, we're, we're not going to count the 81 season. So 250 in 82, that's good, but 196 in 80, 83, 
in 84, he pitched 183 innings. And then I get went up back up to two eight two thirty two. Even when they went to the to, they made it deep in the playoffs in eighty six, he pitched one hundred seventy innings. I thought that Nolan Ryan was pitching three hundred thirty five freaking innings per season, even as he was getting older in age. This is what normal pitch starting pitchers do nowadays. One seventy eight. This is the most Where were the three. Go ahead. Where were the three thirty? Was was that before he went to Houston? Yeah, there it is. Uh, in seventy four, when he was twenty seven years old, peak. Nolan Ryan was throwing 332 innings in 74. So let's take a look back at 79 and all those years. So 222. I mean, even the as a 31, 32 year old, he was pitching 230, 222. That's what you this see from normal nowadays. Uh, I mean, yeah. nowadays it's like rare, but it's not out of the realm of possibility to get to that ago, level. That was kind of normal. Y- you know what? You might have a point. And I, and again, I did not realize that this podcast was going to go off of like this, but let's find out. We're already on this. We, we had really no uh, format to this show. So let's go back to what year? 2012? Yeah, 2012, 2013. Let's go 2012. Let's see what, 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 who were, where would Nolan Ryan, if we were just take his number, what, what do you want to do is maybe an average, let's say 226, yeah. let's say 225. That's a nice round number with a five on it. What would 225 innings give you now in today's game? In back, in, I'm sorry, in 2012. So we sorted by innings pitch, and he would be sixth overall behind James Shields. I mean, it's still, I mean, the elite. Yeah, you know, it's, it's still top ten, right? Yeah, but it's it's yeah, not. R.A. Dickey getting more innings. Uh huh. Than no one had on average. And those two seasons as a 31, 32-year-old. Okay, well, oh, I thought this would have the ages, but they don't. But, I mean, Justin Verlander was, what, maybe 30-something at that time with the Detroit Tigers about, in 2012? Yeah, about 30. Yeah, he was okay. about 30. All right, well, he pitched 238 innings. So, <laughs> now, albeit, you know, 299, 284, that's just crazy. But, oh, but what happened in 75? Oh, was it look one... at 98. Hmm. But well, 198. But back in 2012, 198 would have been. You're not even making the top. You're not making the first page of this Fangraphs page. 198 is th- uh, 35th overall. He's behind Chris Cap. What I say? 198. Uh, yeah. So he would be 198 is 35th. 35th. Yeah, behind Chris Anibal Capuano. Numbers. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, Annabelle Sanchez, Chris Capuano, Adam Wainwright, when he was, yeah, we talked about Adam Wainwright, we called him out last, uh, on the last episode as well, uh, Gio Gonzalez of the Nationals, Trevor Cahill, uh, so, so it wasn't like he was consistently doing this, I mean, yeah, I'm not gonna discredit him, 284 and 299 oh, yeah. innings pitch, that's a lot, but then you talk about these freak numbers at 332, 326, look at this, he only got to 300 innings twice in his career. But people talk about him getting it like every single year with much consistency. Yeah, just those two years, 73 and 74, 332 innings, 326 innings. What, what, what did the Angels get out of it? Nothing. Nothing. They didn't win any world championships. I don't think they made the playoffs those years. Yeah, and isn't his like career record like average, you know, like what he would average per year, was it, isn't it like, like a 12 and 11 <laughs> oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> Record uh, or something like that. I don't know. Uh, I, I don't. I, you know me. I don't take wins. Go ahead. I was gonna say. It, it, it granted, some of that's dependent on like, oh, like, is your uh your offense decent? Is your fielding okay? Like, yeah. I, I I get that to an extent, but it's like people want to talk about him. Like, he's like the greatest he thing he ever. He carried that team some on his back. Numbers are like. Yeah, and like, yeah, some of his numbers are just like average. All right, and not only that, look look at this man. Uh, he wasn't the only one who got to 300 innings. This guy named Bill Singer got to 315 innings with a 20 and 14 record. He wasn't doing the same amount, wasn't doing the amount of strikeouts, but I mean, Nolan Ryan, I'll give him that. He was an anomaly in that regard. It kind of reminded me of of a Herb score or a Whitey Herzog. Hmm. What? Sorry, not Whitey Hers. Whitey Ford. Uh, when when you could tell that the strikeout for nine innings were kind of uh, uh, outliers. 
Uh, but yeah, 8.7 war, Fangarf's war for Nolan Ryan, 6.2 for Bill Singer. But uh, obviously, the other the rest of the team wasn't that good. But I mean, 257 innings from a guy named Clyde Bright, 185 innings from Rudy May, and then a bunch and of... everything else was like 80, well, 70. Well, 30. I think they this is back in the day when they only had four-man rotations. But you can have four-man rotations when your ballpark is gargantuan. So, But obviously, it wasn't enough. I, mean, I don't think the Angels did anything in '73. What what would their bat? What what did the batters look like? Let me see. How do you want to sort this? War? You want to just um, do or offensive? Yeah, we can do war. Wins above replace. Yeah, Frank Robinson. That's going to help with the 30 home runs and 97 RBI. Oh, a bum! He didn't get to 100 RBI. What a bum! Anything below 100, <laughs> that's a bum. All right, so this guy named Ricky Scheinblum hit only three Ooh. home runs. Yeah, exactly. Three home runs, zero stolen bases. Second on the team with a 1.8 war. That's I don't know. like what... not even starter caliber. I mean, yeah, but it's starter caliber it's on like this team. Borderline starter. Yeah, and uh, this is one of those punch and Judy hitters that I would hate to be to talk about on this podcast, but here we are. It sounds more like a Sean Flannery guy, honestly. Uh, Bobby Valentine, you know who that uh, guy yeah, is. Yeah, like, is that Bobby Valentine? Yeah. Uh, I a think. Win war. No, that's why he's a manager. He ended up being a manager. Uh, Bob Oliver, I think I've heard of that name before, but I just don't know where or how. Uh, Sandy Alomar Sr., you know that guy. 25 stolen bases that year. I thought he was a catcher. Was he catching? In what the hell? 25 stolen, st- stolen bases for Sandy Alomar. He's 80 years old, by the way. It, assuming he's still alive. It says that he's 80 years old. So... I'm looking this up because I'm I'm curious to see how many games he played. Go ahead. I was gonna say it, it's it's funny that he had 25 stolen bases, but a point one WAR. <laughs> second base, he plays second base. Oh yeah, stolen bases don't matter, man. You know that. Um, yeah. Short, so mostly a middle infielder, but he was primarily a second baseman that year in '73. Because you, you hear Sandy Alomar, you think about um, the. You, uh, the son, the catcher, yeah. yeah. But, uh, yeah, uh, Jeff Torborg, that was the catcher. He must have been the catcher, at least one of the catchers. But mm-hmm. negative 0. 0.3. Uh, Veda Pinson, who is a name that gets brought up a lot because we did have his son in our baseball life group for a while. Before mm-hmm. I think he got booted, though, because he did something he shouldn't have done. Uh, negative 0. 0.4 uh, war that year. Veda Pinson. What? What were his, like, did he have any kind of power numbers or stolen bases? Uh, or in like 501 plate appearances, he had eight home runs and five stolen bases with a mm-hmm. 286 on base percentage. So, yeah, this team was crap. But uh, as you can see, advantage for Nolan Ryan pitching at a gargantuan stadium, disadvantage for everybody else in that in that team. Uh, 30 home runs was Frank Robinson, and then 18 home runs for Bob Oliver in second place in that no team. No one was – yeah, and then was it no one else in – Double digits. Yeah, just Bob Oliver. Yeah. Just Bob Oliver. So that's a problem. That's a problem. So, and of course, you're facing the, the Oakland Athletics a bunch of times. So that doesn't help mm-hmm. matters either. The, the Oakland Athletics, I think they ended up winning the World Series that year. Uh, I and mean, we could take a look at to see what a real team looks like, I guess. Let me see. What did the Oakland Athletics do? Let's start with their pitching. And uh, let's see here. Well, we're doing innings. Okay. Uh, oh, look yeah, at that. Not yeah. a single guy pitched in 300 innings. But you know what? They won the World Series and the Angels didn't. You've got Raleigh Fingers, Catfish Hunter, Vita Blue. All of these nicknames. Raleigh, Catfish, this guy named Blue Moon Odom. Hmm. Vita Blue Moon Odom. No, no, no. It's Vita Blue and a guy named Blue Moon Odom. But if you combine the names, you get Vita Blue Moon Odom. Um, so yeah, and Raleigh Fingers was a was a relief pitcher throwing 126 innings. But yeah. there's your four man rotation with Blue Moon Odom, Catfish Hunter, Vita Blue, and Ken Holtzman, who's very underrated uh, in this era. Mm-hmm. But as you can see, uh, only Vita Blue was a guy who struck out more than five inning five guys per nine innings. Again, this is still an era where you can give up as many walks as you strike out, guys. And not be affected, especially this team who knew how to pitch to their ballpark. Uh, interesting enough, only Ken Holtzman had a war above five. Raleigh Fingers, a relief pitcher. Raleigh Fingers, a relief pitcher, 
had a war of 2.4 and only 22 saves. So either that tells me that the Oakland Athletics were just blowing out everybody that they saw or Raleigh Fingers was being utilized in the fifth inning, the sixth inning, the seventh inning. Daryl Knowles, as you can see, nine saves for some guy named Daryl Knowles, eight saves for Horatio Pina, and two for Paul Lindbald. Lindblad, sorry. Um, so yeah, it's it was uh it, it just seems like it was a a patchwork yeah. rotation. From my understanding back during that era is that like your a, a lot of your relievers were more of like three inning kind of guys. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes you don't so, qualify for the save, you just you know Yeah. Yeah. So you, you like a prime example of that is like a guy like uh Kenta Colby would be throwing like ninety innings a year mm. and only like twenty five saves, but he would also have like close to ten wins. And it's it's just interesting to see how like the starters and relievers and even like the, the difference between like a long man and a closer has evolved even in the last you know 40 50 years yeah and, and now you have guys like today like you have guys for like every inning of the game readily available where and you got like the lefty lefty righty righty and all of that where yeah Back in those days, it was like, oh, well, we're just throwing out, uh, you know, this guy for four innings. Yeah. And we don't care who who the batters are because we trust that he's going to get them out. Mm-hmm. Excuse me. Um, <clears throat> yeah, because nowadays it's more specialized. Everything's specialized. Just like in football, mm-hmm. just like in every sport. There's three-point specialists in the basketball. There's... Uh, three point kickers <laughs> in football. That's a bad example, but <laughs> anyway, uh, look at the hitting lineup for three point kicker, <laughs> <laughs> uh, especially if you're a oh, well, you have one, Justin Tucker. You're a Ravens fan. Oh, no, you're a no, I'm not. I'm a Cowboys fan? fan. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. Sorry to hear that, bro. And you, you, you would have been better off rooting for the Ravens. I'm sorry. Well, they didn't exist until the year I was born. So that kind of became a problem. So just jump ship, bro. It's the Cowboys. Who cares? They have plenty of fans. Anyway, uh, yes, <laughs> and I double-checked. 73 World Series, the Oakland Athletics defeated the New York Mets four games to three, it looks like. Mm-hmm. Uh, where is and it? Then with, with hitting, you've got yeah. Jackson, Bando, yeah. uh, and, and the top guys. Yeah, Reggie Jackson, Sal Bando. So they this is a more complete their, their pitching wasn't like uh grabbing you by the face, especially they didn't have like a Nolan Ryan on that team. But they did they had a Ken Holtzman who just did enough to uh keep that team above water. And they had a guy like Catfish Hunter and now and all these other pitchers that did uh, Vital Blue, really good pitchers mm. that did enough that you know, you saw the numbers for the pitchers. They didn't look anything impressive, but they did enough to get you by eight up innings, eight up enough innings, not 300 innings, but still a, a large amount of innings. Like, you know, 200, 200 something. Yeah. And then you have freaking Reggie Jackson just belting mm-hmm. home runs, doubles, scoring Steel, a ton of runs. So. Still 22 yeah. stolen bases that year. And this is a more complete I mean, hitting. Have, I'm what sorry, what was that? Bill North has is, is he in the fifties in stolen bases? Fifty three stolen bases that year for Bill North. I don't know who Bill North is, mm-hmm. but that's that's a lot. But it, as you can see, this is a more complete lineup, a more complete team, a more well rounded roster, and that's the difference between the uh, Angels doing nothing with Nolan Ryan at his peak, and a team like the Athletics who were just winning championships every single season, it seems like. Uh, Bill North in 73, what was he doing? In 73, he was a uh, center fielder. Oh, wow. I didn't realize he was a center fielder. Wow. And played two games in right field, it looks like, or two innings. What is that? Oh, two games in right field. So, yeah, primarily a center fielder for Bill North. So that explains why he's so fast to steal 53 stolen bases. Sorry. Let me put this over here. Uh, Gene, Ten- Gene Tennis, Tenace, I think he's the catcher. 
Uh, so you know how important catching is. Or, or was that Ray yeah, Fossey? Yeah, Ray pretty... Fossey was the catcher as well. Hmm, hold on a minute. I'm confused. Yeah. What was Gene Tennis? Gene Tennis. I don't know how to say it. I think it's tennis. T E N A C E. Catcher wow. for 33 games. So that means he played first base for 103. Okay, so yeah, he's okay. Oh, because yeah. Ray Fossey's on the he team too. The guy that, yeah, he, he must have been when Fossey was taking a day off. Yeah, the backup catcher. And then Ray Fossey is the guy who uh, was run over by Pete Rose in that Pete interview. Rose. What year was that? Uh, Ray Fossey. Was that, was that in the All Star game? Yeah, All Star game. And where Pete Rose uh, ran him over. Let's see what that says. Uh, it looks like it's 1970. So people like to say that, well, after that, Ray Fossey was never the same. His career was over. But he played on 143 games and appeared in 532 plate appearances. And he hit... And what, 50-something RBIs? 50-something RBIs, which for a catcher, I think you'll just you'll gladly take at that point. So, but yeah, how much... Go ahead. That was before catchers were like the power hitting, you know, uh, like the... You know, Mike Piazza hitting 30 home runs, 100 RBIs type guy. Yeah, and that 73 was Ray Fossey's, like, last year as a full-time catcher. So I guess in that regard, these people are right that he wasn't the same after that 70 hit, but he still – he was an integral part of that for, World Series run. And he still played for another few years after that too. Yeah, so that his career ended in 79, but he wasn't the full-time catcher that he was in 73 mm -hmm. anymore. Uh, his batting average dipped, and of course, it went back up to 301. <laughs> the baseball's so weird like that. He had a really good season by his standards in 76, 1976. But yeah, his mm -hmm. career, uh, uh, it, it, he was already on the dip, and he was only, what, 27 years old when, when we saw the dip go for him. Yeah, but wait a minute. When he got ran over by Pete Rose, 70. Uh, he was that, he was 23 in his first full-time year. Yeah, and he made the All Star he game. He got destroyed by Pete Rose. Yeah, he was a promising, I, game. He, promising catcher. Eighteen home runs, three hundred seven batting average. I mean, the fact that he still was able to complete this season with this, with this, with these stats, it does just show me that maybe that hit is so overrated. Because otherwise, I mean, and for that, maybe we'd have to see the box scores and game luck. But you don't get to four hundred ninety seven plate appearances with by a catcher. Home runs. By yeah. just be and, and because you didn't do anything in the second half. I mean, and, well, can we look at that? Ugh, I didn't want to do that, but let's see. Can we do that? Can uh, we, no, we cannot. No, baseball reference has the uh splits like that. Mm. Well, we're not on baseball reference, we're here right now, so hmm. uh, uh, and even then, the game log is it only goes back to there's not a big like game log thing. Oh, because it, it's 79 mm -hmm. is the game log. So there's no game log in 70, 1970. So that's a shame. So let's wow. turn that off. But yeah, Ray Fossey uh, was hit double digit home runs in 71, double digit home runs in 72, won a World Series in 73. And I think he might have won in 74 as well. Did the, the Oakland Athletic 1974 yeah. World Series? Who won that one? Do you and remember? Did, uh, I can't remember off the top of my head, but I got I, I got it. I got it. I got it. 75 too. Uh, 75 was the Red Sox, but 74 were the A's. They beat the Dodgers in four games to one. So Ray Fossey was a part-time catcher in 74, but he was, you know, still there. He helped, mm -hmm. he helped in some way win a World Series. So, so there you go, man. Um, so maybe there is some truth, maybe there isn't, but it's, it's sometimes catchers, they naturally wear and tear and their careers start dipping down for no reason. Like Adley Rushman this year. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah i mean uh, someone, the go ahead i was gonna say it's someone whose career um did kind of it wasn't like a serious serious like drop off but had a similar you know experience getting worn over mm. like ray fossey did uh buster posey mm -hmm. that like he was it, he still had okay numbers for the last you know few years after that, but yeah, that like really made a big difference at least for like a more like long term thing. Maybe like it's like a short term. Yeah, you know, he might have a year of like oh like he had twenty home runs. 
Mm, but, but that like when I saw that happen, I was like, man, I'm wondering how this is going to affect them, even if they put them out in the field at first base. Yeah, well, concussions that that you we've seen for catchers ruin a lot of uh, big time careers, like Joe Maurer. Uh, Justin Morneau, mm. uh, Buster Posey, and that's just in this era. So uh, this current uh, era of baseball from like 10 years ago. But speaking of which, I mean, we were just talking about that. Uh, you know, 2012, there it is. There's a – that we've talked about who the best pitcher was at that time. It's, oh, yeah, Justin Verlander, Felix Fernandez, Clayton Kershaw, uh, Gio Gonzalez at number four, and Cliff Lee rounding out the top five and fan graphs about, uh, with wins above replacement. Cliff Lee runs out the top five. So. R.A. Dickey, you Darvish. I mean, yeah, you, you and Chris Sale, got, got good names. And the K per nines were hovering around 8.5 to an, an even nine for the top mm-hmm. five, with you Darvish being above 10, Max Scherzer being above 10, actually above 11 at that point. But for the mm-hmm. most part, the elite pitchers were around 8.5 or higher. Uh, mm-hmm. And if we go to 2023, let's go back to the present and talk about the present a little bit. If we go back to 2023, the K per nines among the elite are, you know, uh, nine or higher. You got two guys uh, well above 10, well above 10. Uh, and then there's Logan Webb at 8.08, which I we talked about that the other day. He's basically Adam Wainwright of 2012, 2013. Mm. So it's funny that you and I are looking, we're looking at the 2012 numbers. Uh, but yeah, most of these guys are, above nine and anybody below eight i mean jordan montgomery he's we, we don't yeah. think about him as in that regard 11.7 anyone's ever really thought of him as much of like a power pitcher kind of like that yeah uh so 10 guys finished with a double digit k per nine last year and that was mm-hmm. in a rejuvenation of offense so the strikeouts were still going on and we look back in 2012, right? That's the year we were looking at. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And like I said, only two yeah, guys. Two. Yeah. You, Darvish, and Max Scherzer are the two guys we just mentioned. So, and like I said, so what would have been in 73 then? Uh, I guess we might as well look at 73, right? Since we looked at it earlier. Yeah. In 73, when the A's won the World Series and Nolan Ryan was dominating in quotes, and yeah, he's the only guy, and that's why he's remembered so fondly is because he he was he's the only guy above eight. Yeah, he was an anomaly. He was an anomaly. So we, you know, we don't want to like he he's the most overrated and underrated pitcher of all time when you really think about it. But yeah. he's overrated for all the wrong reasons, and he gets wrongly criticized for all the wrong reasons. But at the same time, he, he was wasn't... third in innings pitched, which is weird. Yeah. Yeah, because there's a Wilbur Wood, there's Gaylord Perry, the future Hall of mm-hmm. Famer, Burt Blylevin, there's his teammate Bill Singer, Jim Colburn, Mickey Lolich. Oh, and Ken Holtzman, the uh, the champion, was three mm-hmm. innings. Sh- you know why he was three innings short, right? Because he had to give the ball to Riley Fingers. Yeah. I think about that. So that uh, so going back to the present, we were pretty- three innings save. <laughs> <laughs> We were looking at the current trends, and quickly, I'll just say this about that. I mean, hits were up, uh, just hits were up in general. But uh, let's see, there were also more played, uh, more at bats actually, compared to the last two years, which is kind of interesting. Mm-hmm. But yeah, if you're if if pitchers are doing a great job of shutting down hitters, then of course the uh, the at bats are not going to be as much. But last year, they saw they saw an increase in at bats and also an increase in uh, later appearances as well. They went back to close to the 2019 numbers but 4000 hits that's a that's a a, a three season high for starting in 2021 this is the highest it's been since 2021 4, 40000 hits i should say collectively mm-hmm. in major league baseball last year uh singles w- this is the highest they've been since 2018 26000 singles last year doubles <laughs> go ahead sorry about that. But yeah, you know, the the singles probably went up significantly because you don't have a dude standing thirty feet out in right field. Exactly. Every exactly. at bat. <laughs> like, which, okay. Which all leads... of these things that would that would have been hits are now becoming hits. Yeah. Yeah. Uh we, we talked about Gabriel Moreno being a guy who is a who has a really bad launch angle and 
Uh, but he has a really high hard hit rate uh, after August 21st compared to Adley Rushman and Bo Naylor. He was like at a 46%. Uh, Rushman was 41% hard hit rate. And then uh, Naylor was about 35, 36%. And I, I was correct. I was able to correctly predict that Naylor was a fly ball hitter, which ended up being true after August 21st. Uh, Rushman was probably the most sound hitter of that group. And that's true. He was spraying the ball all over the field last year uh, after August 21st. And Moreno, who I correctly predicted, yeah, let's see, low launch angle, low hard hit rate, but a high exit velocity. Uh, I, I'm imagining that he's hitting balls um, sharply to the ground. And not just that, but it must also mean that he's uh, getting a lot of what would be normally fluky hits. He, I mean, because based on his production and, and his triple slash line, he must be getting a lot of... Uh, 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 a lot of grounders that turn are turning into base hits, and sure enough, you look at the stack. Mm. Said, yeah, a really high uh, ground ball hitter uh, was Gabriel Moreno. Really high ground ball hitter uh, who was hitting a lot of balls up the middle. Which, as you know, Alex, in years past, before the the shift ban, before when the extreme shift was at its peak, those uh, ground balls up the middle. His, yeah, ground balls up behind the bag. Automatic outs. Yeah, especially for a yeah. slow guy like Gabriel Moreno. So as you can see, the top forty eight uh, batting average. Uh, would account for those singles doubles were uh, 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 the highest it's been since uh, 2019 triples things that we don't think about triples uh, it, it, it went over 700 for the first time since 2019 home runs despite the fact that they made up all these rules to help out all these hitters get more base hits implement more speed uh, chicks still dig the long ball uh, mm. home runs were up compared to 2022 by about what you say about 650 home runs more last year than in 2022. Yeah. Yeah. And that's yeah, so uh some so in 22 and 22 and the run production was up. Run production was up. Uh it, so something happened in 2022 where they manipulated they must have manipulated the balls back to the pitchers. And mm. the pitchers were were dominating once again. But in 2023, they changed all that. But with their rules, I don't know if they actually changed the balls. Uh, but with the rules, they were able to get more offense because, you know, they weren't counting on shifts. Uh, the pitch clock was in, enacted. So, yeah, it just little things. Oh, and, and then still strikeouts. The bags were, were bigger, too. The bags were bigger, yeah. So all these little things hit by pitch. Wow. Uh, even hit by pitches went up last year. <laughs> <laughs> what's that category didn't go up last year what category didn't go up last year um yeah like is there is there any category that didn't go up in any kind of way uh let's see here it seems like everything is just like we're talking about oh like they got more singles they got more doubles they got more triples no i mean well, let's see if, on bases. well let's see uh no, well, no strike walks and strikeouts were about the same uh oops i'm looking at the wrong thing sorry there you go Okay, walks and strikeouts were about the same. <laughs> uh, on base percentage was as high as it's been since 2019. We talked about that. 734 ops, which is the highest it's been since 2020, actually. Uh, no, man, even the advanced metrics show a lot of, uh, and that's with a w That's crazy. And that's with a WRC plus of 100, which is right in line with last year's 100 WRC plus. Uh, and again, the WRC plus accounts for league environment too so mm -hmm. what what when 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 offense was bad in 2022 they accounted for that so they gave it a, a 100 wrc plus saying that all things considered it was a pretty good year on offense all things considered last year even mm -hmm. with all the advancements in um all these rules to open up the offense wrc plus is basically saying all things considered it was an even kill year for hitters all things considered even with all the rule changes all things considered Nothing out of the ordinary here. It's just a normal average year. Um, batted balls, maybe. Let's find out. Uh, no, line drives were pretty steady within, within the past three seasons. Ground ball rates went down by not even half a, of a percent. But they've been pretty steady because of, uh, at 42 uh, above 42.5% since uh, 2019. And again, launch launch angle revolution maybe. Uh, fly ball rates continue to climb, which makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that's a pop up rate, but it's about the same from the last three seasons. 
Uh, shoot, man. I don't know, man. Uh, pull rate, maybe? No. Pull rate's actually up. It makes sense, right? Cause because if hitter... guys can actually hit the ball to right field and not get out. Yeah, by the by the second baseman who's playing short right field, the rover, or I'm sorry, not the second, the shortstop maybe was the guy, right? Was it the shortstop it playing? Depending be- on, it, it, I think it varied per team. You know, it could be okay. this, whichever guy was the better fielder. Aside, uh, aside, aside, go ahead. You know, I was gonna say it's it, it it's interesting to think that all you had to do was just adjust some of the rules, mm-hmm. and hitters would still hit the same way. Yeah. And then, the, but the numbers would be a little bit different. You're like, oh, well, he's batting like 245 instead of 240 this year. He's got a few more singles to to right field. And all you had to do was just be like, oh, well, we're not going to let you, you know, shift over so far. Well, here's the other scary part. Uh, even the stack has numbers. Exit velocities were up. Hmm. Launch angle uh, has been going up. Uh, in the last, uh, well, the, that's why it's called the launch angle revolution. But launch angle has really accelerated since uh, 2016 or so, and it's just been increasing every year. Last year it was the highest it's ever been since 26, since uh, and, and from 20 since 2016. It, 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 last year was the highest launch angle since 2016. Since you know, I'm looking only at the last seven seasons, I should say, or eight seasons, I should say. Barrel rate is way up, like astronomically yeah. up. So they're getting the hang of this. So you, you combine an understanding of what barrel rate is, so hitting the ball at the barrel uh, with more exit velocity, and you're opening up the offense. This is the results. Hard hit rate's up, 39.2%. That's the highest it's been in this eight-season data set. I mean, I mean, it's, it's so... Everything is love. <laughs> And I can only imagine what it looks like for pitching, but that might have to be something we, well, my guess might as well just quickly look at some of the things here. Uh, since 2016, was there any trend? I mean, I can assume that the trends are going to go down. Oh, look at this crap. Look at this, the win-loss records. Oh, well, that's the really beginning of Sunday for all the dumb reasons. Sorry about that. Of course, it <laughs> so stupid. Sorry about that, folks. Uh, whoa, I just found out oh, something. <laughs> Idiot. <laughs> Uh, you know, I mean, unless if it's gonna like be so skewed that there's more bad teams, then I don't really see how that that's that's gonna be like. Oh, well, I should really look at it. <laughs> well, let's look at starting pitchers only, right? Let's just look at starting pitchers. Starting pitchers. Yeah. Okay. So uh, uh, let's see what we find here. Okay, innings pitched by starting pitchers. Well, obviously that went down back to 2021 mm-hmm. numbers, but 24, but it's still close to 25,000, but. Nowhere near close to the 2022 totals of uh, in the innings pitch category. Uh, so like that, that, the K for nine went up. Yeah, and uh, it was just crazy to think that offenses is up, but those they the, these 30 teams, you know, analytics revolution. They're still preaching strikeouts, strikeouts, strikeouts. I don't care how bad of a pitcher you are. Um, name me a bad pitcher. I can't think of any right now because I'm only thinking about good pitchers. Uh, but um, uh, well, since I'm an Orioles fan. Uh, we uh, had Joey Crable for the last like three years. We finally got rid of him. We 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 said, "All right, we have enough people on the back end of the roster that that your uh, five hundred thousand dollar a year salary is not worth anything to us." <laughs> uh, yeah. So, and I bet you that guy put up some respectable strikeout numbers. I don't even know who that guy is, but I'm just predicting here. Uh, like. I, I don't have anything off the top of my head, but I, if I remember correctly, he had his K per nine was actually pretty on par with the rest of the league. It's just mm. he oh, gave yeah. up too many runs. But well, that's the era we're living in. So, uh, walks are up for pitchers, clearly, despite the strikeouts. Walks are up, but that's you know more strikeouts, more pitches to throw to get to those strikeouts. So that should equal to more walks. Uh, the home run per nine was actually. Back to 2021 uh, figures, but they did go up way up compared to 2022. I mean, that's how they must have done. Either either pitching was an all time high, or they perfected the extreme shifts, or Major League Baseball really, really did something to those balls. Doctor the balls. Yeah. And this is in 2022 where they were trying to get pitchers to stop uh, uh, using um, 
all these foreign substances, right? Isn't that the year that they yeah, started like the, uh, policing that? The spider attack. What was that something they um who which pitcher was that that was you know, like Garrett, was notorious? Garrett Cole and now yeah, we're thinking maybe yeah. you Darvish. But it's okay when you Darvish does it because he got cheated in twenty seventeen and his confidence but went down. The thing that's kind of crazy to me is even without using stuff like that, the the spin rates are still mm. like insanely high. Yeah, and yeah, again like on the curveballs and sliders and sinkers and everything, like the spin rate is still like ridiculous. Good point. So I don't really think they did much with getting rid of the like spider tack stuff. I mean, granted, it's, it, it's it's changed the the home runs. But like, are these home runs on fastballs or stuff that's gonna you know mm. break more? Or that, again, I you got that, the. That, I was gonna say you got the launching a revolution playing a part in that. So the hitters are looking for more home runs anyway. But you also have mm. the stack cast revolution as well. I mean, there, now there's a lot of revolution going on, and people still want to talk like it's 1973 out here, like we are. We just did right now. So call me a hypocrite. But let's face it, man. <laughs> oh, don't 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 i'm not getting into that right now. Maury wills 500 stolen 19, bases 1962 season was, was yeah, fi- horrendous. well career 500 stolen bases and we're gonna uh uh speak poly on a pollyanna form a uh, manner about old-timey baseball here's the ultimate old-timey baseball player and when I brought it up, hey, so he'd be a Hall of Famer because in his era, I mean, he sold a lot of bases and he was a, 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 a an igniter. Contact leader. Contact leader. Just, he, he personifies what the 1960s were all about. Nah, he doesn't have enough home runs. Like, okay, well, then don't came, don't tell me this cock and bull story how stolen bases are very important to the game. Bullshit. <laughs> anyway, uh, ground ball rates are down, massively down, but we just saw the hitters, right? They're not hitting any more ground balls than the ones they are. Uh, they were being debilitated by the extreme shift. But now that the shift is gone, those ground balls are turning into more base hits. Uh, home runs for oh. fly ball. Uh, well, that's a, I hate this. What is the ERA? That went up. Uh, oh, wow. uh, back to 2020 figures, yeah. But again, wow. 2022 is looking more like an anomaly than 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 mm-hmm. a standard. Uh, just like 2019 is an anomaly for hitters, right? Yeah. Uh, 440... These, these ERA numbers... Except for 2022, they generally look like the like average pitcher during the steroid era. Yeah, then you have guys like Pedro Martinez having a sub two ERA back to back years. Yeah, and people still talking about it like that's the greatest thing they've ever seen in their lives, which I don't blame them. So pitching, I mean, we saw that last year. Alec. I, well, maybe I forgot you didn't play last year, right? No, no, I didn't. No. But, but it but I kept up with you know how the you know how teams performed and and the uh, the way that you know it definitely seemed like even just with like uh, what do you call it the eye test mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. not even necessarily looking at the numbers too often but just the eye test is like yeah like hitters are finding a way to get on base more pitchers are still striking out people at high rates um you know but teams are still finding ways to win regardless Mm -hmm. like the good teams are going to still find a way to win even if their numbers are outliers yeah and that's one thing that i like about good teams They, they 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 know how to still be that level team regardless of what the makeup of the team looks like. Yeah. And I have a ton of respect for that. And with, and I just personally speaking here, it was because I play in a semi-weekly league, which is, you know, instead of daily, it's, Lineups, a new matchup is for Mondays and Fridays, right? New matchups every Monday and Friday. And we have to start five starting pitchers. Okay, no big deal. Last year, though, oh, my God, it was it was a test of, of, of attrition here. or Right? That's the right term. It, it was a war of mm-hmm. attrition 
war of attrition, just setting your lineup, looking for any starting pitcher that could post respectable numbers. And it was a pain in the ass. That's I even asked the guys, hey, pitching is getting weak. You guys want to scale it down to maybe three starting pitchers or four starting pitchers? And so far, everybody's like has this apathetic attitude in that league. So I guess I'm just going to keep it. I mean, because that, that's a disadvantage for everybody else. I'm trying to make it fair for everybody else. But advantage me yeah. because that, this is all I do. <laughs> like, you know, I, I'm looking for the Christopher Sanchez's and the uh, – oh, who's another guy? Oh, and, and any of the, I love the Detroit Tigers, man. Reese Olsen, Tari, uh, I was able to – I think I snatched up Tariq Skubo. Or did I, I don't remember. But, yeah, I, I'm looking far and wide for any, any kind of uh, starting pitching help. Let's see here. Do I still have that? No. Oh, I have to go here now because it should show – who was I looking out for back in August or September? Yeah. Uh, oh, July. Well, either way, July was the last time I updated this report for myself. But yeah, this is what I was looking for. Maybe Bobby Miller, Cutter Crawford, Reese Olsen, J.P. Sears, Ryan Nelson. Can any of these guys help me set up a decent lineup out there? Anybody, please. I'm begging you. And this is what I would do. This is bottom of the barrel, fifth and sixth starting yeah. pitchers on teams. Look just well, to set my lineup. I feel like with with Bobby Miller, I give him, you know, like another year to kind of set himself into the rotation. No, you have nothing to worry about. No, he's ready. He's ready now. He's yeah, ready yeah. now. He's ready now. But, no. like, he was that guy like last year that you're like, okay, just give him like a little bit of time, mm -hmm. let him set like settle in, and then like he's gonna like go off. And what was really stupid with the um, the White Sox when they were like, okay, we're putting Dylan Cease on the market. Mm -hmm. They're like, okay, well, if the Dodgers want him, we want Bobby Miller. Ugh. Like, are you kidding me? Like, yeah. You're, you're wanting guys that are significantly better than the dude that you're getting rid of who <laughs> was <laughs> who was – a Cy Young winner, granted, yeah, he had a really solid year. Was that two, three years ago? Yeah, uh, uh, but, in twenty twenty two, which we're we're finding out twenty twenty two was a fluky year for pitchers, apparently. So, yeah, but you're you're wanting like a guy who has a ceiling light years ahead of the guy that you're trading, like e even when they were putting him on the market and trying to get uh, the Orioles. Mm. they're like you know bait them into a trade they're like oh well we want guys like you know like a jackson holiday or like mm. a no, Obi no, no. mayo or a samuel basalo and i'm like these no. dudes are like top five in, the, in our farm system yeah and they are like perennial all-star year in year out kind of guys so and the best that you can give up is mm -hmm. a mid Dylan Cease, who, great, like I'm, I'm not going to complain if anybody actually wants him. Mm -hmm. Because if he can get back to 2022 numbers, you know, you're you're not going to complain about that. But knowing that he's regressed, mm -hmm. and outside of that Cy Young season, I don't think he really put up big enough numbers to warrant. Like, oh, well, we're going to go after like you know, three or four major prospects out of another team's farm system. It's always been a potential thing with Dylan C's upside. It's always been about the upside with Dylan C's since the very beginning. So, yeah. So, I mean, how about this trade? Uh, either, either for Dylan C's, if you're the Dodgers, you either give me Tony Gonsolin or Dustin May, one of those two pitchers, right? Give me a reclamation mm -hmm. project because the White Sox love to get these reclamation projects. Okay, so you're not gonna get the catcher Diego Cartaya, which is uh, one of Harry's guys on his uh, yeah. that he can keep in his minor league slot in his fantasy. But league with well. with Gonsolin, it wouldn't. When you say that he would still be too much, no, no, hell no, 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 no. Guy from coming back from Tommy John surgery, uh, he's already close oh. to thirty years old. So well, yeah, it, I guess that makes sense. Yeah, but that's why I say it's a reclamation I, I, project. I guess I was thinking about like that. What was it that year that he put up like mm -hmm. massive numbers? 
But I, guess, I guess I was, he I was, was thinking like, oh, in that, like in that regard, it'd be like, oh, well, Dylan Cease, you know, probably wouldn't put up those. Yeah. Kind of- you're not going to get Miguel Vargas from the Dodgers, even though he's kind of a post hype uh, prospect at this point. Uh, mm-hmm. But the Dodgers are not going to use him, like because they they're so loaded and they're in win now mode. But maybe the White Sox can go and get him. Uh, mm-hmm. You're not going to get Andy. I think it's Andy Pages or Andy Pages. Mm-hmm. So the the pickings are slim. Maybe you get a Jose Ramos who's only 23 years old, but he's at Rule Five. No. Mm-hmm. Oh, he's going to be Rule 5 status soon, I guess, is what it means here. Anyway, uh, let's go. Oh, and I'm only looking at AAA. I'm not even looking at the the, the lower levels. So, I don't know. Shoot. Catchers, they already got a catcher, so not first baseman. You want to look for shortstop. Okay, let's look at shortstops. Is there anybody here on this list that might, I don't know, maybe this guy named Joendry Vargas because he's 18 years old and he's the 12th ranked yeah. prospect for the Dodgers. Maybe but you go after uh, what's the name? Sweeney, they're definitely not going to get by any means. Yeah, and we, yeah, this, yeah. So you might have to dig deep for these uh, long term lottery tickets. Uh, the only other position would be maybe like a center fielder because you can, at worst, plug the mid corner outfield. Yeah, maybe. So maybe a Kendall George. But I don't know who any of these guys are. I'm just kind of, these are teenagers. So you you get yeah. your reclamation project in either Tony Gosselin or Dustin May. You get two teenagers who play premium positions in center field and shortstop, and maybe you get a a, a long term pitcher as well. If you're lucky, if you're lucky, this is yeah. like you know, you know some expectations. So you may, maybe yeah. you can get a Jackson Ferris or a Carlos Duran or a Peter Hubeck. or I, you go to go ahead. I don't. I'm not too sure on. On, um, well, like Ferris being like someone that would, I guess, be of like equal value, but that that may just be be me. I'm just throwing out names, man, because like you said, yeah, they want yeah. these high premium prospects. Which you're, hell, Corbin Burns didn't even garner that. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I was gonna mention that trade during the podcast at some point, but I'm thinking like, uh, what was it? Um, what's his name? Jim Bowden, the mm-hmm. former GM. He, you know, a cu- couple months ago was talking about like, Oh, well you're going to, to get Corbin Burns, you're going to have to package like, you know, th- like two or three of like the top 10 prospects and like, mm-hmm. like a deal hall who, who ended up being a part of the trade. And they were like, Oh, well you're going to have to give up, you know, like a, Colton Kowser or like a Kobe Mayo or someone like that who, you know, if they, you know, fit into the league well, they're going to be, you know, all star caliber. Yeah. And yet, yet all the Brewers got was DL Hall and Joey Ortiz. And granted, I I like Joey Ortiz. Same. Yeah. But, but his, I don't think his bat is so far has developed enough where with, the Orioles, it warranted getting but so much playing time or being able to, you know, fit into the lineup, you know, mm-hmm. but by any means, um, I think it like his power numbers th- didn't progress the way oh, the, yeah. the team thought it would, mm-hmm. but his glove is still really good and, and that's where his value is. Which... So the, so the Brewers got something good with a guy that can play second, short, and third that's mm-hmm. got a good glove and ha- is a good contact hitter, but his power is kind of like um, kind of hit and miss. Like he, he has the potential, but he hasn't put up the numbers. Why does it feel like you're you're describing Luis Urias is what it sounds like? Because I have really I mean, high... I have high hopes for for Joey Ortiz, but I also had high hopes for Luis Arias. So, um, so that's these are uh, Joey Ortiz's numbers. Triple uh, A last year, his second. Well, the first year at Triple A in twenty twenty two was like a. Uh, that's after he got called up from Double A. So his first full yeah. season at Triple A is full season as he can get. Uh, nine home runs, eleven stolen bases. So you know, you're sure. hoping that he'll can become a 15-15 guy at best, right? 
but he's a skillful guy. I mean, he knows how to take walks, relatively limited strikeouts, most nice on base percentages, but yeah, mm -hmm. can that translate to major league success? Yeah, and I actually saw him uh, play in double A in 22 because mm. uh, Bowie came to Richmond and you know, it was a nice uh, chance to be able to see, you know, prospects in my team's um, farm system. And he was actually playing third base that day. He, he did all right, but they had uh, like Henderson and everyone else playing and I'm like I like Joey Ortiz but I just don't really see how he's gonna like push for getting his name being in that rotation like long term yeah yeah so I, I, I was okay with that trade yeah yeah because uh, for those who don't know the Orioles are loaded in their minor league system and they have a sh ton of infielders and they have a ton of infielders in the major league roster, and they have a ton of infielders in the minor league system as well that are ready to play right and now. A ton of center if, fielders too. If they were on any other teams, those guys would be so much hype. But because they're in the Orioles, and the Orioles are are in win now mode, all of a sudden, uh, those some of those minor league players are kind of. If you're not Jackson Holiday, you're, you're gonna get buried at this point because it's just mm -hmm. they're just so loaded, and it's just and, and again, it kind of reminds me of what the Astros were doing when they were on their way to a championship. It just so happens that they got some guys. I still don't know who the guy is. I mean, I should probably memorize who's a GM there, who's running the show, who's the president opposite over there. Uh, in Baltimore, yeah, your team, yeah. Um, Michael Ice, he was the um, like the assistant GM with the Astros when they went through their yeah, re rebuild and, mm -hmm. and everything, and um. Elias took like one of the like top scouts um, mm -hmm. and like the like analytics guy mm -hmm. with him to to us, and that's what's really changed us from being a fifty win team to a hundred win team. Yeah, it's a thing of beauty, and shame on me for not catching on that. I still thought they were the same old Orioles from 2016, 2017, 2018. Anyway, uh, Joey Ortiz, 90 mile per hour exit velocity in his AAA stint uh, in uh, in the 2023 campaign. So that's encouraging a max exit velocity of uh, close to 115 miles an hour. That's promising. 45.3% hard hit rate at AAA. So that's promising. And he can still do all that yeah. while controlling the strikes. So that, that's why I like him. But obviously it doesn't lead into much production offensively in terms of the counting stats, but mm -hmm. uh, I'm very excited. I mean, I mean, I'm only saying that because, you know, this nine home runs, 11 stolen bases. If you listen, if you listen for fantasy baseball purposes, nine home runs and 11 stolen bases in 88 games, maybe that doesn't impress you. Maybe, well, maybe it should impress you. I don't know. It, it, I'm really bad at this. So I still got to use a calculator. So what is nine home runs? And let's, what, what would you say? 145 games. Is that a good number for Joey Ortiz? 145 games for him to play. Yeah, I'd say 140, 145. Okay, so kind of the, so it, nine home runs in a 140, that's about 15 home runs, like I just said. Uh, mm -hmm. I, hopefully 15, 15 type maybe of player. 20, like, yeah, maybe 20 stolen bases if he's really got a good thing if, going. If you were to extrapolate that season he got in AAA to a 145 game season, you're talking about a guy who's hitting 15 home runs and 18 stolen bases. You know, solid. They're not the most sexy numbers, but for a second baseman, you with the high batting average and a high on base percentage and limit strikeouts, he's all these. Also, I'm sorry, what? Yeah, he's also only like five nine, so that's yep. like a oh five eleven. Oh well, oh, sometimes this so, is five eleven. Oh, sometimes, they, sometimes they lie. Sometimes they lie. I don't know. We, we, uh, Sean and I, I used see, to have these I, arguments all the time. I saw him play, and he looks more five nine than five eleven. Oh man, you know how those pesky eye tests are, man. I'll, I'll double check and see what other websites say. Uh, five eleven. Uh, okay, MLB.com says he's five nine, but he's yeah pudgier apparently. Um, so yeah, so I don't know who to believe in, but I'll I'll take you. Baseball Reference also says five nine. So I don't know; they're just copying whatever, uh, whatever uh, MLB is saying. But you know, ESPN also says five nine. But again, who's who are they getting their information from? But I'll give it to you. Five nine is it going to be the is is going to be the consensus? Joey Ortiz is five nine. Go ahead. 
Yeah, and you know, that's like if he's putting up those numbers at five ninety, he's what like a hundred and ninety, hundred and ninety ish pounds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's not like a ton of frame to work yeah. with. So putting up like maybe peak years like twenty like a twenty twenty season, that's that's pretty good for someone who doesn't have much of a frame and hasn't you know, hasn't hit the major league level long term. He played part of last year. And I think, you know, that's that's some pretty decent numbers and especially when you think even though he can play most of the infield, he's probably gonna fit in more at second base. I'm not going to really complain about those numbers. Like if he that, if he becomes like the... Ben Zobras light, I think Brewers fans would be ecstatic. Yeah, yeah. All right, let's quickly look at your team, the Orioles, and we'll finish. We'll wrap up the show. That thank you so much for appearing. But yeah, we got Gunnar Henderson, who uh, somebody cut in our league, the league that you're joining with us. Somebody cut him like in the middle of the summer, and you know your boy had to take him. Like, well, if you're going to give me Gunnar Ooh. Henderson, I will take him and route to a championship. Solved a lot of my third base. Whoever problems. cut him, I'm gonna respectfully say on this podcast, you suck and you were an idiot. Yeah, it, uh, it's it was. I think it was AJ who was the last guy to uh, commit to this league. So, hmm. yeah, Atlee Rushman well, batting number two. Sorry, according- buddy, but, <laughs> sorry, buddy, but that was that was a bad move. <laughs> really bad move. <laughs> Uh, Gunnar Harrison is your leadoff hitter. Adley Rushman batting number two. These are the roster resource uh, website uh, penciled in lineup. Anthony Santander at number three. Ryan O'Hearn, who uh, former Kansas City Royal uh, disappointing Whoa. prospect. <laughs> now he has rejuvenated his career at the age of 29, 30 years old in Baltimore. Austin Hayes was just, I keep saying I've been waiting forever for Austin Hayes to do something. And looks like he's going to be a mainstay in this lineup batting number five. Cedric yeah. Mullins at number six. Uh, Ryan Mountcastle, who I still don't like, but he's batting number seven. Jackson Holiday, that's the guy to get excited for, batting number eight, yeah. and that is going to be the guy who makes or breaks this season. And Jordan Westberg like, at number nine. Yeah, go ahead. Westberg play it. Was that playing second? Or uh, third? for now, for now, second base for now. Yeah, second base. I like that. I mean, actually, what I've heard a lot is that. Westberg will play third, Henderson will be at short, and mm. Holiday at second, just mm. so that is I mean, granted, yeah, Holiday is like a great, great guy. Mm-hmm. Probably about the best prospect that you could ask for. I want him. But I've heard that he doesn't have necessarily the arm yet to play shortstop, so mm. they would probably kick him over to second to get his feet wet and Mm-hmm. figure it out because uh, Henderson has got the frame to play anywhere in the yeah. infield. He's got the arm to, mm-hmm. you know, to, to make that uh, be shortstop for at least a couple of years. And but then I'll probably make the Machado move to third because, mm. you know, I'm sorry, Machado holiday. will, but well, he like, Machado was supposed to be the shortstop and then switch over to third. Oh base. yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Like you know, he plays with the Padres, right? But no, you're talking about when he was with the Orioles. Make, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. But, Sorry. But eventually, probably within the next year or two, mm-hmm. Henderson will be long term third base. Westberg will probably fit in it anywhere in the infield. So yeah, yeah. I'm I, I'm really liking this. Uh, and you look at. Go ahead. I, I don't. I just don't understand why Mount Castle's batting seventh. Because he sucks. There, I said it. I don't like him. I. I <laughs> power is power is great, but on base percentage is usually bad. Strikeouts are pretty high, low contact he just rate. At everything that a hitter shouldn't swing at. Yeah, and that's, when you have power that, like that's him, his he, downfall. When you have power like him, you can get away with that. But that's not my type of hitter. And the fact that he can't feel worth a lick. This guy came up as a third baseman, and they turn him out in the outfield. Well, can you play first base? No. All right, guess you're playing designated hitter then. Thanks, guy, for nothing. Well, what's what's crazy is, is, is his numbers last year at first base were actually pretty good, like from like a, a fielding system. perspective. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I, I don't care. <laughs> first base. If you're not Keith Hernandez, well, I don't care. Go ahead. If you're not Keith Hernandez or uh, Don Mattingly. Yeah, or Mark Grace. 
I don't care. Anyway, uh, looking at the bench, you got a couple of guys who were regular starters for a majority of the season last year, relegated to the bench because all the hot shot prospects are coming up. Ramon Urias is still on the Urias. team for now. Jorge Mateo, who got out to a really torrid pace last year, uh, right out of the gate. He's now on the bench. Sam Hilliard, former Rockies player. James McCann, who is just a journeyman. Mm-hmm. Um, I think he's still getting paid by the, by the Nets. He's probably the best backup that a team could have. I think at this point, and for a long time of his career, he should have been a backup and backup only. So you you might be right about that. There's Corbin Burns, the big acquisition. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, I wonder who's starting opening day for the Orioles this upcoming season. They should give it to Kyle <laughs> Bradish because he's been with the team for so long, right? Uh, Uber prospect Grayson Rodriguez at number three. I just mentioned Kyle Bradish at number two. John Means coming back from surgery at number four. Mm-hmm. And Dean Kramer. Oh, yeah. At number five, Dean Kramer in a revolving door of number five starters for this team. But I think this is as solid of a pitching lineup as you can get. I've yeah. never I've never liked yeah. the Orioles. One through three should scare anybody in the league. Absolutely. One through I know, three should scare. I've gone years not liking the Orioles rotation, but this is the best Orioles have looked in that rotation in a very, very long time. Let's quickly go over to the bullpen. Uh, Craig Kimbrell, you believe in him or no as a closer? Um. Maybe not entirely closer. I would. I mean, I I I like his stuff, mm-hmm. and I don't want to use his postseason fall last year as like a oh like we we should like be so worried or anything. Yeah, but I would say to be safe, and I could be wrong about this, but to be safe with not having Batista this year with uh, the. Tommy John and everything, being able to use Kimbrel and Cano kind of as like a tag team for closer mm-hmm. would probably be the mm-hmm. most optimal thing to do. Mm-hmm. And you could, I mean, you've still got Tyler Wells, who I like him as a starter, but it seems like he just can't get past that 100 innings limit. Mm-hmm. Like he, he starts to fatigue. Yeah. He's got stuff that could be, you know, like a borderline eighth, ninth inning guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Kimbrel, I, I, for the most part, yeah, I, I like him. I like him. I, I just don't want to assume one direction or the other, you know. Or members of one direction, Harry Styles. I like your Harry Styles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I like this bullpen last year around this time much better than this year. However, now that we know what we know about how bad starting pitching or just pitching in general was. But, yeah, mostly starting pitching is what we looked at. But uh, th- you would think that there might have been some sort of uh, spillover effect to the relievers last year as well. But oh, yeah. relievers also are more dominant because they don't have to pitch five or six innings. They just can go all out, balls to the wall for one inning oh, or yeah. two and at most. I had a couple of guys like uh, Wells and Bauman who can spot start if you need them to. Right. That's why they're at the bottom of this uh, bullpen. But I like yeah. their bullpen a lot better last year than I do this year. And I think a lot of it had to do with Felix Bautista and Yenir Cano, who uh, uh, I kind of saw him coming, but not like that. I didn't realize that he was going to just oh, yeah. dominate where he had just a no-hitter. Yeah. He had a no-hitter going for like the first uh, 11, 10, 9, or how many, 8 or 9 appearances that he made. Yeah. yeah. So that, that was uh, crazy. I'm wondering how Dylan Tate would do this year. He was injured for a lot of last year. Here we go. Uh, Dylan Tate uh, projections: four forty-eight ERA, seventy innings pitch, fifty-four strikeouts. That's uh, a guy that I am not looking to draft in fantasy, even in yeah, deep fantasy yeah. like holds leagues or whatever. I'm like, nah, I need the strikeouts, brother. But his I, his, his, his twenty-one to twenty-two seasons were uh, mm-hmm. were pretty solid, but he got hurt at the. I think he got hurt at the very end of twenty-two or the beginning of last year, and just never. Yeah. I, what he he played maybe well, like a couple games and then was just out, you know. So it'll be interesting to see if if he can get back to form mm-hmm. or if he's just going to be you know your average guy in the bullpen that's like oh well, we're we're going to get a few innings out of you and we're you know we're not going to be upset about it. Uh, the guy I'm looking as a dark horse for this team is Sion Sionel Perez, which is a guy who always showed up a lot in. Just mm-hmm. me doing a little bit of research because I, I uh, well, in this league that you're in, season was was amazing. 
Well, in this league, uh, we do use three relief pitchers in this league that you're mm-hmm. joining, and we also account for holds. So Perez's name always showed up as a candidate to be picked up off of waivers. He just I never was able oh, to yeah. pick him up. So, but maybe this year would be different. Although his projections are a little bit lower than what I remember them last year. If if assuming mm-hmm. I'm remembering the same guy uh, around this time last year when I was doing these projections, but Cionel Perez might be a guy I I kind of uh, keep an eye on. As the season wears on, I see. Uh, was the third guy, uh, Kalum? Danny, Danny Colum- Columbi? I don't know. You, you, 34 yeah, year old. I think it's Kalum. He, yeah, you, he is ahead. older, but he's last year he actually did really good, except for I think it was like one game against the Braves. He gave up like a walk off homer or something, but oh, jeez. He did, he did really solid and su- surprised me. It was kind of like a older version of like a CNL Perez is coming in and like, mm. you know, kind of shocking you that he put up such good numbers. Yeah. For those but, who can't see yeah. the, both those pitchers, CNL Perez and Danny Colum, Columbi, uh, left-handed mm-hmm. pitchers, by the way, they're soft paws. So, uh, Columbi, 65. Enough of them. <laughs> oh yeah, for, for sure. 65 strikeouts and 63 innings pitch are the projections for Danny Columbi. So we'll just see, but I thought the, when I looked at the roster resource from last year, they, it looked a lot better than they do this year. I, I'm just being truthful. So we'll see if uh, if maybe uh, I'm just – my mind is warped right now. But yeah. uh, I did tell Harry, like, yeah, compared to all these other teams, uh, because I was trying to, you know, give them some hopes for the Yankees, right? <laughs> mm. uh, Every compared- year we, we always hope for the Yankees, right? Oh, you know, yeah. Uh, how the tables have turned, the turntables – turning mm-hmm. spinning the ones and twos but all these teams have problems i told them the red sox have problems the red sox can either surprise people and win the division because i actually do like some of the players on that team but will it be enough to usurp like a team like the orioles or the rays no but i wouldn't be shocked if they did but they can also yeah, finish man. with 70 wins this year as well so who knows yankees have their problems they- or- go ahead well, the Red Sox still having Devers playing third base, even though he's committed the most errors as a third baseman every year that he's been in the league, is still baffling me. Now, let me ask you: Are those but throwing errors? Really... Are those throwing I... errors or are those fielding errors, like balls that he can that he gets to, but he can pick up cleanly? Because if they're throwing um, errors, that's one thing. I mean, but if it's the ones that uh, the uh, oh, who's the guy that Harold Reynolds used to shit on all the time? But then we found out that he also led the league in errors. Um. Anyway, go on, go on. But I, I just feel like either way, like his, his his fielding numbers are atrocious. The only reason why he's still at third base is well, obviously his bat is like amazing. But if from what I understand, the Red Sox don't really have any other people that can fit into third base that are really any better. In the field, so they're kind of stuck with him. So well, it, well, to 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 finish up the spiel <laughs> here, uh, the Blue Jays have their own problems. The Rays have their own problems, and the only team I told them this is what I told them: the only team that seemingly has uh, all everything answered are the Orioles. And we're now seeing that maybe their bullpen isn't up to par compared to last year, especially with losing Felix Batista. But I wouldn't be surprised if this bunch right here that you see in front of you, this bullpen, is able to just do fine without Batista anyway. So, and then I'm not going to get into their, uh, because we'll be all here all day talking about their minor leagues because it's pretty damn good. Mm-hmm. I like it. But uh, since you mentioned the Red Sox, we'll finish with the Red Sox then, and then we call it a call it a day. I'm pretty sure my wife is waiting for me. Uh, who is waiting? Let's see. Can anybody in the major league roster play third base instead of? Uh, Rafael Devers, maybe Emmanuel Valdez, although, yeah, he, I didn't really like him last year. Bobby Dahlbeck, but we've seen that experiment before. Uh, he's anybody? first base material. Yeah, and he's not playing on this team first base because this guy, Tristan Cassis. Yeah. Did you hear that Jaron Duran is, gonna, is, is in talks of getting traded to the Padres? I did not hear that, but it... This oh, morning. It, 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 doesn't, it, it doesn't surprise me. I mean, I think he he could fit in well with this Red Sox team, but at the same time, it's like 
the players that have the potential, but they're like there's so many different question marks in different areas of their skill set mm-hmm. that you're just like, I'm not really surprised if they would be in talks for trades. So this is the third baseman in the minor leagues. I guess Chase Mydroth, another lefty batter, 23-year-old, could step in if he has to. He's the 14th-ranked prospect as of uh, the 2023 report for Fangraphs. So that could be a thing. But you're right. I don't think they're in a rush to call this guy up. And mm-hmm. and as far as – yeah, there's we're looking at double-A, single-A guy. So this would be it. I also try to see if any infielder would in their system. But this guy may be the best – for them uh hit high hit tool guy uh yeah he, he's not expected to be called up until 2027 but you know that's just an estimate what was his fielding projection like uh, like a 35 or 40 <laughs> well it, it is according to the zips projection defensive uh the defensive what is this runs above average the defensive fielding positional adjustment by fangrass says he's at 2.4 which hey if it's positive you'll take it right it's mm. positive. Uh, seven home runs last year in Double A, only nine stolen bases in Double A. But okay, combined with the high A that he, the high A performance, did a combined was that nine, 14, home, nine home runs, thirteen 14, stolen bases. 13. Uh, can control does it has decent plate approach, plate discipline, but really a punch and Judy hitter does not have much much power. So let's see, do they have any fielding metrics or fielding statistics for minor league players? Let's see, they have this. Uh, in 2023 with the Red Sox, he, oh, at third base and shortstop, but we're only looking at third base. Uh, 35 put out, 64 assists, and I don't know. I, I that doesn't tell me anything. Five errors, but I don't know what kind of errors. Yeah. Seven double plays, but again, what is that? What's the context there? So it's hard to gauge, but I assume he could play his position better than Rafael Devers could. Is, but he's nowhere near ready, and yeah, and he's a his bat's not gonna bring him up anytime soon so uh other than that I, got... I don't think that the with that kind of bat that you're gonna keep him at third that doesn't look like no nah, that's uh like second base. yeah that that's like second base. but what what how, how big is he uh fangraphs has him listed at 511 or okay yes yeah. yes yeah, so he'd probably be second base because i don't I don't necessarily think you would probably be. I'm double checking enough long term for shortstop, even though he played some shortstop. Correction: five nine. Fangraphs yeah. has him at five nine, so that must mean he's five four, right? <laughs> this is what we we're finding out. <laughs> Chase yeah, yeah. my draw. Uh, height. Yeah. Let's see, let's see what they say here. Yeah, five nine. Okay, so MLB has him at five nine as well. So we're gonna go with that. He's already. 22 and a half years old, but he's not projected to be up for another three years. Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. And uh, this is from the 2023 report. I don't know what this means. I just, at this point, I'm just taking them at face value because I can't wait for them forever, fan graphs, to update everything that they need to update. Sometimes they go until like May, June, finally updating their 2024 report. But I'm just taking them at face value and, and the offensive numbers will provide context for me. And yeah, if, if the bat is this bad, He's nowhere near ready to be called up. No, and definitely not for being a third baseman. That's like second base. And they have other long. guys here like Pablo Reyes and Romy Gonzalez, utility players who are closer to 30 than they are to 25. Uh, Romy Gonzalez is 27 years old, 30 years old for Pablo Reyes. Um, mm-hmm. But they're just utility guys. They're just you know guys that you just yeah. spot and start. They're kind of too old to be like, oh, well, we could like mm-hmm. – Plug them in for more of a long term, or even enough for a short term at third base to put Devers at DH, so you so you're not dealing with whatever fielding faults that he has. I love I like the Red Sox bullpen. The rotation might just be good enough to keep them above water, but you know, they can also Which like got- Lucas Giolito. Are we? Are we getting? I was just gonna. I was just gonna get to it. If Lucas Giolito implodes more more often than not, then this is not gonna be good. If Brian Bello can't uh, uh, add some sort of deception to his fastball, because right now it's looking mm-hmm. like a like a big juicy burger to some of these hitters, 
if yeah. uh, Tanner if Tanner Hoke and Cutter Crawford can't stay in the rotation because they've been shuffled in and out of the bullpen for so long that they don't have the arm strength to mm-hmm. to last long. And Nick Pavetta mm-hmm. is thirty one years old. Pavetta, yeah. And we've been waiting for him for, since forever and a day now to be a consistent starting pitcher in Major League Baseball. He's just he's just always letting you down. But the bullpen might be a thing. But um, I've heard it, rumors that the Red Sox might shop Kenley Jansen. Yeah, because if they're not expected to win, you might as well get something for both Kenley Jansen and Chris Martin of Coldplay yeah, yeah. because, uh, yeah, he's getting up there in age. Chris Martin could be one of the better relief pitchers that no one knows about, but he's also mm-hmm. 37. He's nearing 38 years old as well. So uh, Garrett yeah. Whitlock might end up in the rotation, but they're going to put him in the bullpen yeah, for now. Awesome. Josh Winkowski is pretty darn good. But again, if they were so damn good, they would be doing a lot better than they have shown. They wouldn't be... Mm-hmm. Well, think about it this way: Would they be really good in the in the AL Central? Would they be like a second place team in the AL Central? I I would think so. I like their lineup. I, mean, I, I would think they if they played well that in the AL Central that they could probably push for winning that division routinely, even yeah. in their bad AL East years. So yeah, wrong division, wrong time. But anyway, uh. This went a lot over. I thought this was going to be a quick episode with you. Saying, ah, you know what, what, what? But this ended up being a very interesting episode. We we did a lot today. Like not even, and, you know, I had a format ready with Harry. I didn't have a format ready for you. We basically got the same results. We talked about old timey baseball. We talked about new baseball. We talked about your team, the Orioles. Uh, any last words from you, man? Uh, actually, I actually have two quick things. Okay. One, I'm really excited about the new ownership with the Orioles. Mm-hmm. I mean, the to consider that the three of the minority investors are Cal Ripken Jr., Grant Hill, and Michael Bloomberg. Do I have to worry about where the money's going to come from to <laughs> get people? And you've got uh, David Rubenstein, who's been a Long-standing fan of the team, mm-hmm. he's been a businessman and you know really wanted to fix um, the downtown area and and everything. So I'm I'm excited about that. But one thing I did I was wanting to mention um, it was the um, the fun trivia thing that I mentioned to you earlier. Right, right. Go ahead. Kansas City Royals first baseman Vinny Pasquantino was a high school classmate of mine. No way. Yeah. I love that, I love that dude, guy. Yeah, dude was two grades behind me. Uh, when I first met him, he was like six foot 170 ish. Wow. He was like six four, two forty five 245 now. Can't steal second base to save his life, but has our potential beyond belief. Unfortunately, couldn't stay healthy last right. year with the uh, sure. labor room and everything. Yeah, sucked. But I, dude is dude is legit. I drafted him in all three of my leagues, in my points league and in my two categories leagues. I wanted all of Vinny Pasquantino, and yeah, that was. I mean, he was already struggling to begin the season last year, but then he was out for the, the year. Torn the yeah. torn labrum, yeah, the shoulder, and that I don't just know had if me scrambling. the shoulder. Thing, like the official diagnosis for the torn labrum was just like a like a build up of like his shoulder was just bad to start the year and it got to the point you know that he needed to get surgery or what but yeah it, it his his average can kind of fluctuate power numbers are great don't expect them to still second base though yeah um definitely not I know what I get myself into with him. By the way, I'm 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 researching Kobe Mayo because I'm I'm a, like I told you I'm I'm trying to input my Orioles guys into my mm-hmm. minor league prospect spreadsheet, and and that's I'm not sorry those are just those are just the hitters. I haven't even gotten to the yeah. pitchers yet. Uh, yeah. Kobe, I didn't realize that Kobe Mayo is a big guy, six five, two hundred thirty pounds, with immense power potential and a really decent hit tool for that power potential. So mm-hmm. he I can play. I, Corner outfield, third base, first base. I want them all. I want Kobe Mayo and Jackson Holiday on my on, on my fantasy teams, uh, my long term mm-hmm. fantasy teams, I should say. 
like my keeper league and the one that I could protect my five minor league players because we're starting mm -hmm. over in the baseball life league. Uh, and, and, was, and in case you don't know, the league that you joined is not a keeper league, so you're only drafting for this year. So maybe not in this league, <laughs> but it, it, if he gets called up, you know, you know, I'll be the first one to pick him up. Yeah. Yeah, uh, you'll be the first one to pick him up. I don't, I don't believe that you're gonna pick him up before I am. Well, like, I, I think I mentioned in the uh, basketball league uh -huh. that I've been notorious for refusing to take players from my favorite teams because of a superstition uh -huh. that they always play terrible uh -huh. when I'm gonna have them. Uh huh. So yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you ended up getting Anthony Davis and LeBron James. So, well, but. They were the uh, two best players <laughs> available at the time. So Homer I pick. Really... No, I'm joking. I'm joking. This is, uh, no, you, you, those are the guys you had to pick, and and I don't know how, how's your team, fantasy basketball team doing. Um, I'm currently beating EJ. So well, that's I good. Yeah, I need you to beat EJ. Good. I need you to beat EJ because I, I I'm on the outside looking in the playoffs. That Zach Levine injury and having Killian Hayes in my starting lineup did not work out so well for me. But I'm yeah, finally I see that you had to get rid of them. A long time ago, but it's finally coming around. It's coming. Come, I feel a, a comeback, a coming around. I'm the team that nobody wants to face in the playoffs. If if I even make the playoffs, so I'm hoping for really good things in that league as well. But that's for another podcast. Thank you so much for joining me this morning, this afternoon, uh, course, Alex. Man. And uh, this has been the Total Basis Podcast. I was Felipe. That's Alex over there. We will see you next time. Take care, everybody. Take care, Felipe.